Okay, class. Uh, so, can you guys hear me? Just anyone? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, um, I'm just going to go ahead and continue with the lecture that I was doing um, uh, yesterday. And so, I'm going to just screen share the PowerPoint slide here. Um, and I'm also recording this in uh, Camtasia. So, I'm going to have to do a little bit of adjusting but can you guys see the the slide yeah okay perfect all right so um we left off talking about um eukaryotic cells and so just remember that eukaryotes that uh sorry eukaryotes uh you means true and so karyote is nucleus and so eukaryotes have a true nucleus and you can see that nucleus is here in this eukaryotic cell um, it houses the dna and you know dna uh, contains all the instructions uh, for building the every organism that's uh, on earth um, and we talked a little bit about how dna is turned into rna and you know the this has been kind of talked about a lot in in the news and about the vaccines because the the uh, current vaccine the Pfizer vaccine is an RNA vaccine and then that RNA is made into proteins and this protein vaccine uh, is the Johns the kind of the old school vaccines and that's that's a protein vaccine so uh, you're sort of just cutting out the middleman by doing a protein vaccine but we talked a little bit about how rna is unstable so prokaryotes there that means before nucleus and so prokaryotes which is this cell here it doesn't have a nucleus it has an area where the dna is found and it's it's kind of this stuff that you can see in here and, and that's called the nucleoid i don't care that you guys know that or not um but it's just a region where the DNA is found. It's not enclosed by a membrane. So you can't have, it's not compartmentalized differently than the, the cytoplasm like it is in, in this, this, this really big eukaryotic cell that we're looking at here. So on the test, you know, I'm going to ask you to distinguish between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. And, and the first distinction is eukaryotes they have a nucleus prokaryotes don't and that's the tells you that in the name the other distinction is that in prokaryotes they don't have any membrane enclosed organelles remember we talked about the cell membrane in the previous lecture and that's made up of fats uh, and we and that the reason is is because i kind of talked about you don't want to build your house out of paper because when it rained, it would it's kind of water soluble and so it would disintegrate. And you you wouldn't be able to maintain homeostasis, which is super important for uh, living systems. Uh, so in prokaryotes, they don't have these membrane enclosed organelles, and so they can't carry out specialized functions. Um, the Okay. Um, like like compartmentalizing DNA and stuff like that. You can think of it as an apartment complex, right? If everybody, uh, if you didn't have walls between everyone else, then everyone would have to have the same temperature in their apartment. But once you enclose things, then you can have different temperatures and different environments. So the having membrane bound organelles in eukaryotes allows them to have different things like you could have a lower pH in an organelle uh, in a eukaryote. But in a prokaryote, you can't do that because there's no uh, membrane. There's no walls separating the different rooms, if that makes sense. Um, so everything's just out in the cytoplasm. Remember, this is that word for 
cytomine cell and plasm you can kind of think of as you know ghostbusters like goo it's just a mixture of salts and sugars and things like that so so all this area out here is considered the cytoplasm and prokaryotes everything is considered the cytoplasm um, and then the this is also called the cyto sol cell solvent because there's so, like a solution and we'll cover solutions in chapter three. All right, so another difference is prokaryotic cells have a tough external cell wall. So not only do they have a membrane, so here's my prokaryotic cell. It has, a, it has to have a membrane. All living things, all cells have a membrane made up of fats. Um, prokaryotes have a cell wall, right? Um, on the outside and different prokaryotes have different cell walls when you guys get in the micro uh, you'll do something called a gram stain and that gram stain tells you what kind of cell wall these bacteria have the cell wall for bacteria is really important because we'll learn this in chapter 9 but in order to produce that ATP that we talked about in the last lecture your energy currency kind of like your gasoline um, you have to move electrons across a membrane so that you you can generate a charge on one side like a battery and this is how we make most of our ATP and you'll see that when we go over respiration in chapter 9 um, so Imagine if a bacteria, for whatever reason, um, were to lose that cell wall, then what would happen to the charge that, that's right here? No takers. Okay, so this would, these, uh, charges would just drift off and so you would end up with no charges and if you have no charges then you have no way to make ATP and then what do we did we say that one of the things that all living things need is energy so without a cell wall bacteria can't make energy and without energy what happens Anyone? Die. Yeah. And and so what's interesting is most antibiotics uh, attack this cell wall of, of bacteria, and that's how they work. They destroy this cell wall, which prevents the bacteria from making energy, which causes them to die. And the reason that it doesn't affect you is because you and as you're in the kingdom animalia. And animals don't have cell walls. So you don't have to worry about the antibiotics affecting you the way that they do uh, bacteria. You have a different way of making energy than they do. Um, and we'll cover that in chapter 9 as well. So um, this cell wall is really important uh, to these prokaryotes. These, and by the way, all uh, bacteria are pro considered prokaryotic. So bacteria have cell walls, <clears throat> but um, all cells, no matter what their size is or their makeup or whatever, and we talked about this, when we talked about the cell theory, they're uh, complex and they're the smallest units that carry out all of these processes that we defined in the first lecture as necessary for life. So, um, just to recap, eukaryotic cells, do they have a nucleus or not? Yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, if I ask you on the test and you say yes, you're going to get it right. Prokaryotic cells, do they have a nucleus? There you go. And so that's a question I might ask you on the test. I also might ask you on the test, do eukaryotic cells have a cell wall? We haven't covered that yet, so that's kind of a tricky question. The answer is some do, 
some don't like plants do animals don't fungi do um, and, and they're made of different things and we're going to cover that in chapter five but i might ask you do prokaryotic cells have a cell wall And the answer is always yes, they do. And then I might ask you, do eukaryotic uh, cells have enclosed organelles? Membrane-bound organelles. The answer is yes, yes. yes, right? That's exactly right. Do prokaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles? No. There you go. So look, you're already on the way to getting 100% on the first test. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so what's important here is that that the all of life that as we know it is based on DNA. There are some viruses, uh, like the coronavirus, that are RNA viruses. Um, and then we talked about okay, well, are these really alive or not? And half scientists would agree that they are and half would say they're not but what's <clears throat> what's really interesting here is that all living things right well um, we're going to exclude viruses here all living things use dna as their source of information and dna uh is made up of chemicals but we use the first letter of the name of each chemical so there's adenine guanine thymine and cytosine and so this is sort of the alphabet that we use for dna a g and t's and c's <coughs> excuse me and um so this is just you can equate this to the alphabet in the human language you know a b c d e f and so on and so i could i could convey something like this word with the with the english alphabet and when i write that out what do you think of you think of a furry rodent with a tail and maybe you think they're gross uh but i can rearrange these letters and make this word and does that make you think of a furry rodent with a tail and then shouldn't no, no. so so it's the arrangement of these letters that are important when you're making words and sentences and it's the same thing with the dna so if i have this arrangement or this arrangement this is going to produce a different chemical protein um, then this one will and 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 what's cool about <coughs> living systems is that um, unlike all the different languages so so this wouldn't be the same in say Greek or Arabic or French or whatever they would use different letters or different words or different combinations of letters um they may even be, be read differently in left to right instead of right to left but uh, dna is always read from uh, what we call the five prime end to the three prime end so it's always read in the same direction you i'll explain this to you when we get to chapter five uh but trust me it's true and every living thing uses the exact same alphabet so it would be like everyone on earth spoke english and they used english letters and they wrote in english and everything was read from left to right um and and what that means is that has really cool implications uh for for uh using dna to our advantage which is we can take dna from any organism because the instructions are the same and put it in any other organism and it will uh still read that piece of dna 
and create that same protein that it would in the original organism. So I'll give you an example. There's a, a jellyfish called Aqua Victorians and um, let me change this to um, Okay, yeah. So, can you guys see my window that's open for the class? I'm just gonna do a little internet search here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna uh, look up uh, green fluorescent protein. Um, and so, this. Uh, protein, this green fluorescent protein, is made by this jellyfish, uh, Aqua Victoria, and it's it's a protein. It comes from DNA, and it, it's used by scientists to track uh, medications and things like that. Like if you were doing experiments on a virus, I'm sorry, I should have turned off. Um, if you were doing experiments, say, on the vaccine for COVID, you want to make sure that uh, it's the, your mRNA is getting into the cell so that your cells are making the spike protein so that they make antibodies to protect you. Well, you can't, it's hard to see those molecules because so they're, so, they're so small. Uh, but one thing you could do is you could add this green fluorescent protein to it, and then when you excite it with ultraviolet light you can literally see it go into the cell because it glows green and so people thought this is kind of cool and, and i told you guys that i uh, worked for the genome institute of singapore and while i was there uh these graduate students were messing around with these fish called zebrafish can you imagine what colored zebrafish are It's all in the name, by the way. They're black and white. And so they took these zebrafish and they added in this green fluorescent protein gene to these zebrafish. And so now the jellyfish gene is in these fish. It's expressed in these fish. And so it causes them to glow green. And you could... Can you guys see this image? Hopefully. Did I lose everyone? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see these fish are green. They're green because a jellyfish gene is in it. And these fish are, uh, these redfish, they, uh, there's a, the, a red fluorescent protein that's found in a coral and so they've taken that and made these fish red and they've done it not only with uh, fish but uh, they've done it with uh, pigs so you can see that these pigs they have the green fluorescent protein in them it's from a jellyfish and uh, they've done it to rabbits So you can see that um, you can take one gene from one organism and put it in another. And this is how we sort of make genetically modified uh, organisms or GMOs that uh, crops are resistant to round up the herbicide or uh, other, you know, uh, they're taking genes from salmon because they're resistant to freezing and putting them in strawberries so that the strawberries are not susceptible to 
to frost damage. And they're doing the same thing with uh, fruits and things like that. So they don't they they don't form ice crystals by using genes that are taken out of salmon. And you know this is all uh, cool, but you can also knock out genes. Um, there's a gene called myostatin, um, and and myostatin it. You guys probably know if you don't go to the gym and you're not using your muscles, then you don't you lose them. the The way that that's done is through this protein called myostatin. So if you knock out the gene for myostatin, then it doesn't regulate your muscle growth, and so you have uncontrolled muscle growth. And so this is uh, uh, a dog. that has the myostatin gene that you know was uh knocked out uh in its genetics so this is a whippet you can see that this this dog doesn't go to the gym it's not working yeah. out uh it's just uh a genetic defect uh caused by a gene that's been knocked out called myostatin and this is this is uh mice so this is a mouse that has, this is a normal mouse, right? And this, this is a, a mouse that's myostatin null. Null means that it's been, uh, the gene is defective, so it doesn't function. And this mouse didn't, you know, work out or anything like that. These are siblings. It's just a natural occurrence. So this is, the reason I'm showing you this is because it's, it's really cool that all living things use the same DNA because we can manipulate that to do things that we would uh, maybe not normally do or, you know, cure diseases that we normally couldn't cure before. Um, because we know we all have the same genetic code. All right. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, these the codes for all these genes whether it be myostatin or green fluorescent protein is found in a region we call a gene and we're going to define genes when we get to chapter 16 and we'll talk about this in detail but a gene is just an area of dna that is going to be turned into rna like we talked about and that's going to be made into proteins and those proteins are what make us what we are that makes us flesh and blood do you guys have any questions so far all right so i'll take that as a no um like we said the the dna if we if we drew it out like this is an artist that's drawn this out for your textbook and it's it's this isn't actually what it looks like. It's just showing you this. This is how it fits. So the the code of DNA would be written on one strand as five prime and the other strand is three prime. And I'll, I'll explain this in chapter five, but I just want to kind of put it out there. And then you have the order of the letters, just like you would have, you know, a word in the English language. This is A and C and T and so on. And this, this would code for a protein. I mean, I don't know what it is because I can't read. Nobody can read DNA. We put it into computers and it can give us an idea of what it is. And I'll show you guys how to do that later on. Um, at the, when we've, when I've uh, built up the class and you guys have learned all the basics of biology. But for right now, what you should know is that the DNA strand is a double helix. So this is one helix here, and there's another helix here. Let me change color so you can see this better. So there's one helix here, and there's another helix here. So we say that DNA is double-stranded. We can use DS. 
and change colors again. So DNA is double stranded. Um, and that means that uh, if we have one strand, it has a complementary strand that runs anti parallel, which means if this is five prime, then this end would be three prime. And if there's an A here on the other strand, there would be a T. And if there's a C here, there would be a G. So the rule for DNA is, is that a always pairs with T, and G always pairs with C. These lines right here are hydrogen bonds, which hold the two strands together. And we're going to learn about hydrogen bonds in Chapter 2. So that's what holds these helices together. And if this is a T, I might put this on the test. If this is a T, what would this be? A. Yeah. A. yeah. This is an A, T, and so on. So if I know one strand, I know the other because I know the rule. And you guys are just going to need to learn the rules of DNA because you you pretty much can't get away from it. It's it's This is the basis of genetics and the basis for... You know, defects in DNA usually lend, lead themselves to human diseases and, you know, even animal diseases or, or you know, there's all this talk about the mutations that are occurring in COVID and making them more virulent. Well, it's changes in DNA that's causing that. So if you want to combat COVID, you're going to need to know uh, how to read DNA and how these strands pair with one another so that's uh you know what you should take away from this slide is that uh there's four nucleotides in dna a g c t i haven't asked you to name them yet but we will do that in chapter five and that a always pairs with t g always pairs with c that the dna is double stranded so it's a double helix um, and that's pretty much what it's conveying in this slide any questions about that? No. Nope. Okay. Well, I mean, we're going to get really in depth in this when we get done chapter 16 and 17. But for right now, you know, uh, this is just, I'm just introing what we're going to cover in this class. So we talked about all forms of life same, employ the same genetic code, and we can use that code to our advantage. Like, for example, if someone, uh, had a defect in their gene that made insulin you know i can know the dna sequence of this insulin and if i have the right tools i can reinsert the insulin gene into them and cure them of diabetes and i wouldn't be able to do that if all forms of life didn't and all individuals didn't do this use the same genetic code we can also make insulin and bacteria back in the day uh if you were diabetic the only way for you to get insulin would be to get it from a cadaver so someone had died because you can't just go around ripping out people's pancreases they're kind of using them and then you also uh could get it from pigs but both of those organisms you know could have disease and um, viruses are really specific for organisms that they infect. So um, if you took the gene for insulin and put it in a bacteria, bacteria um, it would make human insulin. So if you took in the insulin gene from a human being, put it in a bacteria, that bacteria would make human insulin because all forms of life use the same genetic code. And then you could re-inject this into individuals and they wouldn't reject it and you wouldn't have to worry about it containing any harmful viruses or anything because viruses that infect bacteria aren't going to infect humans. So that's kind of cool that you're able to do that. So I, this is a really important concept uh, in biology. 
So different life forms uh, are generated by different uh, expressions of the same language. In other words, you know, the the letters, the order of the, the A's and the G's and the C's and the T's, and all those different genes make a dog different from a human and make uh, a chihuahua different from a wolf. Uh, as cells prepare to divide, they have to copy their DNA. So one thing that uh, we didn't talk about is that in your nucleus, and we're talking about humans, right? So we're talking about animals. So we're talking about eukaryotes. In the nucleus, you have DNA. Uh, there you have, in humans, you have 46 chromosomes with about 3.14 billion letters. This totality of your genetic information is called your genome. And so, um, how many copies do you think that you have of your instruction code, your cookbook, in each of your cells? So, if I were to take a single skin cell and look at all the genes, how many copies of those genes would you have? 23? Well, 23? you you have 23 chromosomes but we're talking about the same gene like skin color let's just make it simple so let's say eye color eye color is controlled by a lot of genes but a lot of people think they're it's not so let's just pretend it's controlled by uh one gene so how many of those would you have for eye color in each cell And the answer is you'd have two, one you got from your mom and one you got from your dad, right? And together, so if you thought of all the genes, you know, there's 23 genes that control human height. There's five genes that control eye color, three genes, and we could go on and on. In the end, in humans, there's about 30,000 genes that make you what you are. And those genes are gonna be different, similar, but different in say, a horse or a chicken. And you only have one copy, well, of these 30,000 genes you have, a set from mom, and then you have a set from dad, but you only have one set. You only have one copy of your DNA. So if anything happens to the DNA in the cell, it's forever changed. Um, and when you make a new cell, right? So like you came from, you came from a single fertilized egg. So every time you make a copy of your cell, you have to copy the DNA. And we call these new cells daughter cells. And so you had to go through many, many, many copies from when you were a fertilized egg, which we call a zygote, to the trillion cells you were when you were born. Um, and these chromosomes, these 46 chromosomes, have to move around in here, and we have to divide them equally so that each new cell gets 46 and so that they're all identical. And we're gonna talk about how this happens in chapter 12 and in chapter 13. Uh, but it's actually a quite a fascinating process. Um, and all of this requires copying the DNA. And so we're gonna talk about how DNA is copied in chapter 16. All right, so any questions about this so far? So it's 46 chromosomes, and I'm sorry, it's 3.14 billion. 3.14 billion. A, G, C's, and T's. So if we're going to look at the individual, what we, we call these nucleotides, and we're going to cover this in depth in Chapter 5, but if you were to, let's say your textbook is made up of words, right, in letters, 
So if you were to uh, have that big textbook, that all of the letters that make that up are about, you know, 300,000 letters in there. So now imagine that you would have to stack a million textbooks on top of each other to get the same information in letters that is in every one of your cells. So that means that your cells hold a textbook about the height of the Washington Monument full of information just like your textbook inside a cell that you can't see with your naked eye. It's quite amazing um, that that's even possible, but it is. So 23 chromosomes you get from mom, 23 you get from dad. Together that makes 46 chromosomes. And all of your genetic information that's found in your cell is called your genome. And so dogs have a genome, cats have a genome, rice has a genome, wheat has a genome, pigs have a genome, and so on and so forth. And so this is what we're talking about here. The entire library of genetic instructions is called a genome, right? All of those letters, all of the genes. Uh, humans is, like I said, it's about 3 billion. It's actually 3.14 billion. Um, this, the entire genome of the human, of a single human was published in 2001. It cost over $10 billion to sequence all of those letters and it took almost 10 years. Um, so we have all these letters and it's kind of like if you went to Egypt and you didn't know how to read hieroglyphics and that you had to decode all of the information on the pyramids, that's how, where we are at this point in time with biology. So we have all these letters. We know what the order of the letters are but we don't know how to make the sentences or the words out of them yet. So we're just now learning um, what those words mean and then what those genes are. So of the 30,000 genes in humans, we know about what 5,000 of those genes do. And the rest of them, we have no idea. So the reason I'm telling you this is that there's a lot of, of knowledge yet to be learned in this area of science. It's not like anatomy where, you know, I did read that uh, over the summer or maybe it was just early in the fall about a new organ that was found in the throat. But generally, you don't discover like, oh, yeah, this person has an extra lung or whatever. So... And when you're looking at small things like genetics and genomes, there is so much out there that we we yet uh, we're yet to understand. But however it works, the coordinated activity of all these genes that make all these proteins contributes to the development of a particular organism. All right, any questions about that? Yeah, we're going to get into this again, so, you know, this is just an overview. Um, I'm not going to ask you anything about this, but I'm just going to tell you that there are two principles of biology. One is reductionism and one is holism. Reductionism says that uh, you can understand the organism by studying its parts. So if we look, if we, if we made an example of something like, uh, let's say, the Boeing uh, 737, right? So that has somewhere around a million parts. And so a reductionist would say, well, if I look at these million parts that make up this plane, then I can understand this plane. And a holist would say, well, you can't understand it unless you look at the whole plane. So I can't just look at these 
million parts of this plane and understand how this plane flies because it doesn't take into account uh, the forces of drag and lift and all this other stuff you know that are in physics and so both are valid um, but in this class we're going to be reductionists and when you guys get into you know bigger systems like anatomy and physiology and ecology and things like that then then you're going to learn in a more holistic approach even 182 is more sort of holistic but the 181 is definitely reductionist and so you're going to learn about all of these different parts uh, all the way up to around this level in 181 and uh and then this is you know what this will be like 182 if you guys need to take that if you're in nursing you don't need to take that uh or you know vet tech or whatever but if you're in biology or you're going to go like if you're pre-dental or pre-medicine or pre-pharmacy you're going to need to take 182. so i'm just letting it laying it out there we're going to be reductionist for this whole semester all right so this is just a wordy explanation of what I just said. And you can read this if you want. I'm just going to skip over it because I think you guys get it. Um, organism, this, so this is an important concept in biology is that organisms are open systems. Um, the easiest way to explain an open system would be uh, if you took something like a dam. So let's just say that this is Hoover Dam and behind Hoover Dam is a lake. And as long as that lake's full, then the water will run under the dam into the river, Colorado River, like so. And when it does, it's going to turn these turbines and it's going to make electricity. Right? And so let's imagine if we close this whole system off to the outside world. And so what would happen eventually to all this water? Yeah, it would run, it would run out. Like all the water would drain out of here. And without rain adding to the, the water upstream, we wouldn't be able to flow water and we wouldn't be able to make electricity right so the only way that the hoover dam works is by being an open system and it's the same thing with us if i put you in a box right i put you in a box what happens to you besides being bored to death Yeah, you die, right? Because you can't get oxygen. You can't get uh, food, right? Uh, you can't get all the things that you need that are required for life. Um, even if you were a plant, you would still need sunlight and carbon dioxide to produce sugars and then you still need oxygen to break down those sugars. So we'll learn this in chapter uh, 10 when we go over photosynthesis. But the only way life can exist is to be an open system. You can't be closed. And that means that all of this junk on the outside is really important. Plants are important. Oxygen is important. Carbon dioxide is important. Um, you know, photos, photosynthesis wouldn't work without carbon dioxide you they wouldn't work without oxygen and you'll learn all this stuff uh when we get to chapter nine so the organism is really uh it's a, the environment of the organism is really important and it can the organism can be infected affected by the environment okay so i'm just going to briefly touch on this ecosystem concept um, and the reason is is that we're open systems and so 
what happens is, is that we get ultimately get our energy from the sun. So the sun puts light, which it has energy in it, and that sunlight is taken up by plants. We call those producers. So it doesn't have to be plants. It can be, uh, and we'll we'll learn this in taxonomy, but it can be like blue green algae or any other thing. And so what happens are, are that plants take in the energy from sunlight. They do photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is making, this is making sugars. from raw materials they it's using carbon dioxide and uh, nitrogen and stuff out of the air and the soil to make sugars um, and sunlight is how it does this and then it stores these sugars as energy so you can think of it as like solar panels on your roof. So if you, let's say that I put solar panels on my house and I cut myself off of the SRP grid, I had enough of SRP. So that I get, you know, Arizona, plenty of sunlight. My roof is covered in solar panels. And during the day, I'm going to have as much electricity as I want. I could run, I could, you know, defy my father and mother and open my door and let all the air condition out and air condition Phoenix if I want, because I'm getting free electricity. But what happens at night when the sun goes down? Well, where would I store that energy? In a battery. Right. So I would, I, if I didn't have a battery, then I'd have to be out in the dark uh, until the sun came up. So plants do the same thing. They take the energy from sunlight and they make these sugars, which are kind of like their battery, and they store those so that they can make it through the night. Because plants are like us. They have to breathe oxygen to break down these sugars. And so imagine how long it would take you, how long would you survive holding your breath? Minutes. Right. Uh, plants are the same way. So if plants didn't have a way to store their energy, what would happen to them when when you woke up the next morning? Dead. Yeah. And then we would have no plants. They would never survive. So plants take the energy from sunlight and they store it in the energy of sugars. And what's interesting is that these energy types are different. So when we talk about energy, and this is really important because we're going to talk about thermodynamics, which is the study of this energy conversion. There are two kinds. There's potential energy, and there's kinetic. And so what kind of energy do you think sunlight is? Potential or kinetic? Let me, maybe I should define this. So kineticos is moving. So this is the energy of motion, and potential is store energy because it has the potential to do something so what do you think sunlight is kinetic or potential uh potential uh potential. so where's the sun space millions of miles space. away right so if the energy comes from the sun to the earth how would it get there oh kinetic yeah it has to move oh, and so sunlight is kinetic energy the, it's the energy of motion. And then, so what kind of energy is uh, sugars? Like, let's say a Snickers bar. Potential. Right, because a Snickers bar isn't going to change its calories if you throw it around. It always has that same amount of potential. And unless you're going to eat it, and you let's say you eat it, and now by eating it, that allows you to writing it down notes or your brain to function or you to move or your lungs to inhale and exhale or your diaphragm and so you moving around is actually converting so plants convert kinetic into potential 
and then you eating a Snickers bar allows you to convert potential back into kinetic. So we can interchange these energy types um, as living systems. And anytime we do this energy transfer, we lose a little bit of energy to heat. Heat is kinetic energy. It, it's just, it radiates out into space, right? And so it's kind of lost energy. But we'll talk about this in great detail in chapter seven when we talk about metabolism. And then, so plants take sunlight. They convert that into chemical energy that we talked about in sugars. And then us as consumers, we consume that chemical energy and then we can release it as we can store it, right? Like as fats, that's one way that animals can store their energy. Plants store their energy as carbohydrates. And we'll talk about the difference in, when we get to chapter uh, four and five. Um, but we can also use that energy at, uh, to do things, uh, kinetic energy. So everybody get the difference between uh, what kind of energy sunlight is? If I ask you on the test, what kind of energy is sunlight? And what kind of energy is in chemical bonds? Potential. Yeah. And so what Potential. are plants? Are they consumers or producers? Uh, producers. And then and animals uh, that don't do photosynthesis? Consumers. Sweet. All right. Consumers. And we're always going to lose some energy as heat when we do these these transfers of energy. All right, that's perfect. All right, any questions about any of that stuff so far? Like I said, we're gonna get into detail in all the other chapters. Um, but if you guys have any questions, now is a good time to ask me. If not, I'm gonna go on to taxonomy. So taxonomy is just kind of a necessary evil. Um, when I was in Singapore, that SARS virus came out, The the severe uh, uh, respiratory syndrome. And uh, we knew, uh, scientists knew right away, we sequenced the DNA, and we knew it was a coronavirus. And then uh, we could create vaccines based on coronavirus uh, in order to f fight it. What's interesting is that there's lots and lots of SARS vaccine available, which probably would work on COVID. Um, from the Singapore outbreak, but it was lost or uh, frozen or not taken care of and no one really studied it. And it's kind of interesting that this exact, or you know, the SARS variant has come back um, as, as COVID. And, and one of the reasons that you should learn taxonomy is that if, if you have, let's say, Let's say you have uh, uh, viruses are a little different than bacteria. But let's say you had, let's say you had streptococcus. We'll just call it strep for short. So let's say a new back. And we know that uh, certain antibiotics worked on this. Let's just say uh, penicillin does. And so let's say a new bacteria emerged from the jungles of the Amazon and what would you want to know about that uh, bacteria in order to combat it? You'd probably want to know what it's most closely related to, right? And if let's say you found out that from its DNA that it's closely related to strep, how would you fight that brand new uh, bacteria? You would fight it with the same antibiotics that you use for other strep, right? But if you don't know that these are in the same category, you wouldn't really know what antibiotics to provide to the patient. So that's one reason that taxonomy is really important. And I know a lot of students are like, Bleh. but you know, when you start getting into medicine and stuff like that, you'll realize that this is really critical to know this. So this was developed by uh, Carolus Linnaeus. You should know this name for the test because it's an important name. 
So make sure you know Linnaeus is the father of taxonomy. Um, I get, I told you just like on the last lecture, I don't care about the dates. I just give them to you so that you guys have a reference of how long ago this was. You know, so like we're talking 300, a little over 300 years ago is the first time that we ever officially classified organisms. And so we have really broad uh, categories, kingdoms, and we could put, we're going to go over this again in a second, but we can put these in big groups. Like we can put all the bacteria on the planet Earth, millions of different kinds of bacteria. We just throw them all in Monero. And all the plants, think about all the different kinds of plants there are, millions of different plants. And we can just throw them all into the group plant data. Or, you know, a lot of people just don't even use this anymore. They just call it plants. And all the animals, right? Flies, worms, humans, everything. We just can throw them all into animals. You know, and then we have fungi. And we have protists, which is kind of a weird one. And, uh, and the reason you're probably not familiar with this is because you can't see those without a microscope. But these are those super broad groups, right? Like, like the hundreds of millions of species on the earth are thrown into five categories. This is split out now. And so they, they've split it out into eubacteria and archaea bacteria. And then they subdivide this out into, uh, broader so they call them domains but it doesn't really matter um, there's still these really broad groups and then we can get uh, more specific as we go along so uh, the the way that this is grouped is kingdoms are real broad phylums are more specific class is even more specific order is even more specific family and then we have genus and then species and most organisms are named after the genus and the species. So, for example, humans are Homo sapiens. And most people know that. And so that is the Homo is the genus, sapiens is the species, and together this is the scientific name. So on the test, you'll need to know this order um, just because it's really, really important. And I'll... I know that you think it's probably not, but um, it is, and I'll show you, I'll prove it to you later on in the semester whenever we start talking about DNA specifically. So you can use, uh, you know, mnemonics or whatever you want to try to remember this. King Phil came over for good spaghetti, um, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as you know this, and I'm, I will promise you 100% ask you this on the test so make sure that you know it you guys any questions about this no. awesome okay no. so I don't want you to know all of this I didn't put this on the slide for you to memorize all the scientific uh, nomenclature for the chimpanzee what I did do is put this all on here because I want you to see the pattern so for here, and when we look at kingdoms, humans, chimpanzees, house cats, lions, house flies, they're all in the same kingdom. They, all of these are exactly alike. When we get down to the phylum, right, then it's going to start branching out. So humans and chimpanzees are in the same phylum. So are house cats and lions. They're in chordata, and the, what they all have in common is they have a spine. They have a spinal cord. House flies aren't. They're spineless. And so, uh, literally. And so, they are in a different phylum. Uh, arthropoda, which is includes the insects. And then if we look at class, you know, we can get all of us, uh, humans, chimps, cats, lions, tigers, bears, we're all in mammals. Um, these are in insects, 
the order here are primates, and this is where we diverge from uh, the cats. So humans and chimpanzees are in primates. Uh, house cats and lions are in carnivores. Uh, and then family. So they're all the same here. And then we get down to genus, and we can see that humans and chimpanzees diverge here. But guess what? House cats and lions don't. So what do you think is more closely related? House cats and lions or humans and chimpanzees? House cats and lions. Exactly. And okay. because they're in the same genus, whereas we're in a different genus than chimpanzees. And then this is the species here. Uh, so a couple rules here. And in, in the first study guide goes over this. Uh, the genus and all everything written in front of it is always capitalized. So you can see that in this chart. And the species is always lowercase. You can see that here as well. So when we write it out, like Homo sapiens, you saw me write it out on the last slide. I have to capitalize the genus. I have to lowercase the species. And I have to underline them or I can italicize them, which is done here. Um, it's kind of hard to write in italics. So this is the correct way to do it. If I wrote it like this, that's wrong. If I wrote it like this, that's wrong. Even if I wrote it like this, and, and didn't underline it or italicize it, that would be wrong. So it, it the when you're writing out a scientific name, it has to be in a certain way. And there's a reason for that, uh, because scientists can just look at it and tell what's the genus and the species uh, without having to try to dissect it. But what I want you to take away from this is not only how to write scientific name, which I just went over, but also that if you're in the same family, do you, okay, wait a second. Let, if you're in the same class, so let all of these organisms are in the same class, do you have to be in the same phylum? As I go up, so if I'm in the same class, if I'm in mammals, and chimpanzees are in mammals, no, you don't. the answer is, no, you yeah, don't. you do, because these are broader groups, right? So everything that's like humans and chimpanzees are primates. They have to be in the same class. They also have to be in the same phylum and the same kingdom because we're going up, right? Now, if we're going down, so if I ask you, if you're in the same order, do you have to be in the same family? And the answer to that is no, right? Because you're going more specific so if i ask you on the test if you're in the same class do you have to be in the same kingdom you're going to answer yeah. yeah and if i ask you if you're in the same genus do you have to be in the same species yeah. right and that yeah. and you're not going to know that unless you memorize this order right so you, so it goes back to um You need to know this. You need it. You're going to have to memorize this. And you can do it however you want. Flashcards, whatever. But you're just going to have to. It's one of those things you're just going to have to know. You don't need to know any of this stuff, right? None of this. This is really the only thing you need to know and how to write scientific names. So you guys have any questions on that? No. Okay. So I'm just... I, I, again, I'm not showing you this slide to so that you have to memorize this crap. I don't even know all this. I do know this one because I've taught this class a long time. And this is one of my favorite animals since I'm from Texas. So we're going to look at the nine-banded armadillo. And so we look at the kingdom. It's animalia and because it's animals. It's not plants or fungi or bacteria or protists like we talked about. The phylum's chordata because it has a notochord, which is a spinal cord. 
The class is mammalia, which is animals that have hair and give milk to their young. Um, you know, it used to be live birth, but then that platypus came along. And so, you know, there's always like some weird organism. And then the order is Xenothera. And that's named after this Xenothera process, which is a, a lump of bone on the vertebrae that other mammals don't have. So this makes them unique. And and you know some organisms have it some don't the family is named daisypodidae it's from daisy potus which is greek remember we talked about like most things in science are greek and latin well here's another example of that the greek word for turtle rabbit is daisy potus so when Linnaeus was classifying this, he looked at this organism and said, that looks like a turtle rabbit. I'm going to use the Greek word for turtle rabbit to name it. Um, he didn't use the Aztec name. Uh, I can't even pronounce that. So he went with Greek. And then uh, the genus was Desipus, which is derived from this. And then the species uh, is novum synctus. Do you guys know what novum means? It means nine. And synctus, can you guess what that means? Yeah. So what what is so this scientific name, Daisy Puss Novum Synctus, and then again notice this is uppercase, this is lowercase, it's italicized, means nine banded turtle rabbit. So it's not so foreign, right, as Daisypus novum synctus. We should just say nine-banded turtle rabbit. And we can do the same thing with humans. So, again, I don't want you guys to take anything away from this except for the fact that I'm trying to demystify these crazy scientific names that we give to organisms. And we could do the same thing with humans, right? You don't need to memorize this. I'm not going to ask you any of this stuff. You probably should know Homo sapiens, but if you don't, I don't care. But if we go through this whole thing, again, it's Greek. It means self. Homo is man. Sapien is wise. So Homo sapien literally means wise man. And that's where the scientific name came from. Again, which one of these is the genus and which one of these is the species? I can tell right away because this is capitalized, so that's got to be the genus. This is lowercase, so it's got to be the species. And when you're writing a name, does it have to be italicized? And when you're writing or underlined. Does it have to be italicized? Either or. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you could see that I didn't italicize any of these, but I did this one and I did these all right okay so your book talks about the six kingdom system it it breaks out the archaeobacteria from the eubacteria we're just going to group these together and call it monera it'll save it or it'll make all our lives easier um U is true. I talked a little bit about this in the first lecture. Archaea is old. So these are things that live in extreme environments. Super hot water, like in Yellowstone. Uh, really salty conditions on, on uh, radioactive uh, decayed rods from nuclear reactors. These are the more common bacteria, like ones you find on your skin, like like Staphylococcus or Streptococcus or whatever. Um, these are, are really uh, ancient bacteria that lived when the earth was super inhospitable. And then if you look at uh, Protista, these are uh, single cell organisms, but they're eukaryotes. What are the bacteria? Are they eukaryotes or prokaryotes? Prokaryotes. Yep. So these are all prokaryotes. Everything above that is eukaryotes. And then plants, animals, 
and fungi are all the other four kingdoms that make up uh, the remaining eukaryotic cells. So your guys are going to need to know the five kingdoms and, you know, however you want to learn them, uh, Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plants, and Animals. Um, we classify organisms into these kingdoms based on what they do. So these are just definition words that you're going to need to know. This is just how scientists talk. So if I say if it's modal, that means it can move around, right? So are plants modal? No. Yeah. Are fish modal? Yes. Are, you know, what, yes. you know, whatever. So you guys get the idea. And then sessile, that means that it sits around and can't move. So are plants sessile? Yeah. Are fungi sessile? Yeah. Um, are animals sessile? No. Uh, we also talk about, is it multicellular? That means it's made up of a bunch of cells. And we cover that in the last lecture. Or single cell. So uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, you guys know that. Uh, we talk about colonies, kind of like ants. So there can be, there are some unique organisms that can be unicellular and live in colonies like sponges and so that's how we classify those and then we have autotrophs and heterotrophs auto means self trophic is uh, acquiring food so autotrophs are things that can do photosynthesis And heterotrophs, we would also call those producers or consumers. Producers. Awesome. Producers. And then so heterotrophs are everything that aren't producers. So these are all the consumers. Like like us. Anything that can't make its own food. Now, uh we're going to talk about some exceptions to photosynthesis. There are some crazy organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean that can use chemicals to make their own food. And we call those uh, chemi autotrophs versus photo autotrophs. But for right now, you just need to know the difference between autotrophic and heterotrophic. And again, these are definitions. I think I put them on the crosswords, almost all of these words. But like I said in the in the intro, you don't have to do the crosswords. If you hate crosswords, what's most important is you guys know the definitions. Um, this class is like learning biology, chemistry, and a foreign language all at the same time because a lot of these words you've never seen or heard of. And, and unfortunately, it's just like a foreign language class. You're just going to have to memorize them. All right, so any questions about that so far? Nope. All right, cool. So here's the five kingdoms that we talked about. We're only going to, you need to know these five kingdoms, and you need to know what categorizes organisms into these five kingdoms. Um, because who knows, we might end up going to Europa and finding a unicellular prokaryote uh, and we would need to know how to classify that along with other organisms on Earth. And so uh, you're just going to need to know the characteristics of these so that, so that you can classify them. On the test, I might ask you a question like, we went to Mars and we found a, a unicellular a eukaryote. that's motile how would you classify that all right and i can tell you that if it's unicellular it can only be monera or protista if it's a eukaryote it can't be monera because those are all prokaryotes and it it doesn't really matter if it's modal or sessile because if it's a unicellular eukaryote 
it has to be in protista. Does that make sense? Yeah. I could also ask you, okay, we went to Mars and we found a multicellular uh, eukaryote that's an autotroph and that would go in the kingdom plants because this these are not multicellular this one is uh, not an autotroph it's a heterotroph and this is not an autotroph either so the only thing that would fit all of these definitions would be the kingdom plantae. So you're just going to have to go through and sort of memorize these. Uh, the, this is multi. So I'll just go over this real quick and then I'll end the lecture. So this is unicellular prokaryotic. This is uh, mostly unicellular. I would say all unicellular. Eukaryotic. Some are colonial like sponges, but I won't really distinguish that. These are mostly multicellular. The one exception is yeast, and I talked about that, so we could get rid of this. Eukaryotes, they're heterotrophs, and they they uh, don't move. Mushrooms generally don't move. There are exceptions. There's slime molds that can move, but that's for the most part. And then plants, multicellular eukaryotes, they're autotrophs. They don't move around. You guys know most of this, and they have cell walls. Um, these are multicell eukaryotic heterotroph they can move around animals and they also have specialized sense organs like eyes and ears and you know things like that and then there's some examples here you don't need to memorize these i'm just showing them showing them to you so that you can get an idea okay any questions about that no all right so uh you guys have a good weekend um, I'm going to go jump on the office hours now. So if you have any questions, you can uh, meet me in office hours. Otherwise, have a good weekend and I will pick up this lecture on uh, Tuesday. Uh, professor, so yeah. far our tests were not allowed to use our notes, correct? Uh, no. Professor, so far it's our tests were not allowed to use our notes, correct? Closed book exams. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No. All right. All right. Have a good weekend.